everybody. It's nice to see you again. I'm sure you missed me in the last eight minutes. We are in Heartbreak or Research, Poets on the Writing Process. And we'd like to first thank poets and writers with support from the Hearst Foundations for this panel. Thank you so much for that generosity. I'm really excited about this one because poetry is my favorite genre, probably because it's the most like music. Also, I'm really excited because I love to see powerful women doing their thing. And we have six of them. And we have them from all across the country. We've got New Orleans represented, Vermont, Santa Barbara, Chicago, Oxford, Mississippi. So welcome from all of those places. And the one thing that we are missing is you guys in the audience, because what I love about poetry readings is the vibe between authors and audience as they're reading. So to recreate that vibe, please let us know where you're watching from. Drop your city in the comments. Drop your comments as the people read. We love when our audience interacts with us in this virtual setting. So please do that. We would love to hear from you. Also, I'm really excited because we were sort of able to recreate our annual Poets and Cowboys. Obviously, we don't have boys and we're not being bred, but we do have poets. And we do have the curator and mastermind behind the Poets and Po' Boys event, Stacy Balkan, who curated this event as well. Stacy is, what can I say about Stacy? I could talk about her publications, right? Because she's got the Lost City Museum, Jackalope Girl Learns to Sing. She's got a book called Sweet Bitter coming out. She's also the editor of Fiole and Wing, which I always mess up. I hope I pronounced that right. Fiole and Wing, it's an anthology of domestic fabulous poetry. But I think what I really want to say about Stacy, I've got to riff off the author E.B. White. We all know and love that story, Charlotte's Web, don't we? And I'll just bring up Stacy by saying, it's not often that someone comes along who is both a true friend and a good writer. And Stacy is both. Welcome, Stacy Balkan, everybody. Megan, you can't make me cry before we start. Um, thank you to Dr. Holt. Um, thank you to Candace for keeping all this going. And thanks to all y'all for joining us. Um, we hope that you've seen some great panels so far and welcome you from all these cool places I see popping up across the screen. We are excited to bring you a conversation between all these different poets. And we're going to start with a reading so we get a sense of what each poet's voice is like before we begin. So our first reader will be Sky Jackson, whose book, A Faster Grave, came out recently and is responsible for the title of this panel. So Sky Jackson was born and raised in New Orleans. She holds an English degree and a degree in law. She's one of those <laughs> writers that does it all. She's currently an MFA candidate at the University of New Orleans and the author of A Faster Grave. She is joining us from Vermont. Please welcome Sky Jackson. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here and it's so good to see everyone. Um, I'm going to read a poem for you. Um, this piece is called The Boys with Dead Mothers Become Better with Time. The boys with dead mothers become better with time. The white boy in law school eluded me like a flash of light in murky water, hid me away in study rooms or his parents' Mississippi mansion like a letter that wasn't supposed to be read. Or when I asked him about the book in his car, The Goldfinch, after we spent the night together, he told me it was about a boy and a painting, not a boy and his dead mother. How years later, it would all make sense. In LA, the boy with the dead mother begged me not to leave him the first night we met. Over Louis Armstrong and wine, he kissed me and just said, stay. In New Orleans, the boy with the dead mother tells me that 
he missed his mother's gravy at my parents' house this past Thanksgiving. He asked me if we can roast a chicken to replicate the thickness of the sauce, the way she smeared seasoning all over it, the way he and his father fought over the bacon she laid tender over the breasts like blankets. Why do I love boys whose mothers are dead? What am I hoping that they see in me? What am I hoping that they don't? Thank you. Oh, that was incredible. Thank you, Sky. Um, feel free to use the comments. Here's on. Pretend we're all in the same room together. Um, that was Sky Jackson. Up next, we have Elizabeth Gross, who is a poet, translator, teacher, artist, you name it, based in New Orleans, and the author of This Body, That Lightning Show, which was selected as the winner of a prize by Jericho Brown, whose presence I feel like is ever present in these festivals, and also Dear Escape Artist, a chapbook uh, in collaboration with artist Sarah White. Elizabeth is joining us from New Orleans. Let's welcome Elizabeth Gross. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a short excerpt from a book length um, conceptual hybrid text called Mr. Chance, an interrupted erasure of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Dramatis personae, in order of appearance. Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, a comedy. Myself, as a racing hand. The sea, as danger. Mr. Chance, a shifting concept. Myself, as witness. Volunteers at a camp for vulnerable cases outside of Thessaloniki, summer 2017. Myself, as a volunteer. Residents at a camp for vulnerable cases outside of Thessaloniki, summer 2017. Distance, both physical and emotional. Shylock, the Jew. Myself, the Jew. Thessaloniki as erasure, Pro protection training given by the camp psychologist, English language graffiti, various Balkan locations, Venice as it sinks, history as a looping tragedy, the sea as desire, Shylock the problem, history as erasure, the sea as erasure, myself as erasure. Act one, scene one, a street. I know why I am sad. You say I caught it, born to want sadness, to know our mind tossing on the ocean, on the flood. Believe me, my hopes abroad still know the wind of doubt. Should I go straight to stone and think not of anger? Sad to think upon, Mr. Chance. I hold the world a stage where every man must play a part, and mine a sad one, that I should questionless be where money is. Enter Ham. In Australia, a recent production of The Merchant of Venice changed the ending. What have I done? The Jew's daughter wails, collapsing on the stage, dropping out of both marriage plot and conversion trance, delayed reaction to the previous scene, her bareheaded, broken-hearted father robbed and spat upon. Critics wonder if this is okay, which is how they re I read about it half a world away. A few years ago, I was invited by friends to a Shakespeare reading party. The play was The Merchant of Venice. And though we'd been going back and forth about possible nights, the host decided to push it back another week. And then the date happened to fall on Yom Kippur, or more precisely, Kol Nidre, the annulment of vows, a legal procedure as prayer, which gathers new meanings through Jewish history of persecution. Think conversos during the Spanish Inquisition, unsquaring what oaths they took to survive gathering in secret to pray just once to their actual God. The Merchant of Venice was slash is a Nazi favorite, broadcast over the radio just after Kristallnacht. And then in 1943, when Krauss entered as Shylock, the audience shuddered with a crash and a weird train of shadows, something revoltingly alien and startlingly repulsive crawled across the stage. I texted to say I couldn't come, but more importantly, this party couldn't happen. Right away, my friend replied, Shakespeare is dialectically beyond anti-Semitism. So I said, fuck you. But we did read a different play on another night over rum punch and a ham. Thanks. 
Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'm really excited to get to talk more about this project, Mr. Chance. Up next, we have Melinda Palacio, who I'm always, always, always trying to snag to read. Uh, Melinda lives part-time in New Orleans and part-time in Santa Barbara. So it's always a tricky <laughs> way to get her here, but because of technology, she is with us. So Melinda is the author of the novel, Octeo Dreams and two collections of poems, How Fire is a Story Waiting, and most recently, Bird Forgiveness. She has received first prize in poetry in 2013 at the International Latino Book Awards. And she's joining us from Santa Barbara, California. Please welcome Melinda. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. And this is my second uh, appearance at the Words and Music Festival. And it's always a favorite. Um, but it's been such a long time. And I'm uh, Happy to be here. I um, was communal heartbreak and maybe even global heartbreak. And I wanted to read a, a newer poem, um, a new 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 work for you. And this is Ice Detention, Torneo, Texas. Strange hands spoon feed a hungry baby. Lice fall out of her hair like stardust. The girl is my daughter. The girl is your daughter. The girl is ours. No more food for the baby girl. Her celestial call becomes earthen. She turns into a pig. When all the children morph into swine, their puckered lips turn to snouts inside hell's version of Wonderland. Then and only then did they bust open walls that separated them from their parents. Our eyes go dark. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you, Melinda. Talk about heartbreak and research and living as research. Um, there are so many things we'd rather not have to research, but this is the world that we're in and to read a new poem like that, wow, thank you. Up next, we have Amy Nezuku Matatio, who is the author of the illustrated, of, uh, the author of a book of illustrated nature essays called World of Wonder. It's a beautiful book, World of Wonders. There are so many wonders in this world, as you will know if you spend any time with Amy as well as four previous poetry collections. She is joining us from Oxford, Mississippi, where she teaches at the University of Mississippi, um, somewhere within a few miles of where I sit. Please welcome Amy Nezuku Matatio. Hey everybody, um, Stacy. Thank you so much. It's so it is so wild to um, be chatting with you on a computer and knowing you're in my town here. But I'm so delighted um, to be here. I wish that we were having po boys together um, with everybody here. Um, I'm going to cheat just a little, little bit. As Stacy mentioned, my new book this year is um, essays, lyric essays, and they're all illustrated. I had to show you this little. This guy is my favorite cephalopod. And I wanted to know in the comments, what is your favorite cephalopod? And if you don't have a favorite cephalopod, you need to fix your life and find, figure out one right now. That's your homework for the weekend. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna read a, um, a little snippet of this. Um, I can talk poems all day long, but I thought I'd just share a little bit of a lyric essay. And this is called The Vampire Squid, my favorite cephalopod. <laughs> Way down deep, in the perpetual electric night of the water column, a place where sunlight doesn't register time or silver filament, the vampire squid glides in search of a meal of marine snow. These lifeless bits of sea dander are actually the decomposing particles of animals who died hundreds of feet above the midnight zone. The vampire squid reaches for the snow with two long ribbons of skin, which are separate from its eight tentacles. If it is truly hungry, it trains its large eye on a glow, the lure of something larger, 
a gulper eel perhaps, or an anglerfish waddling through the inky water. The squid's eye is about the size of a shooter marble, but this is nevertheless the largest eye to body ratio of any animal on the planet. Now, if the squid feels threatened or wants to disappear, perhaps no other creature in the ocean knows how to convey that with a more dazzling yet effective show. When the vampire squid pulse swims away, each of its arm tips glow and wave in different directions, confusing for any predator. And to make an even more speedy getaway, the squid uses jet propulsion by flapping its fins down towards its mantle and simultaneously blasting a stream of water from its siphon, all of its arms in one direction. And in the next stroke, the squid raises all of its arms over its head in what is called a pineapple pose. The underside of these arms is lined with tuny type to, sorry, <laughs> is lined with tiny tooth-like structures called Siri, giving an appearance of fangs ready to bite down on anything that wants to chase it down for a snack. As if that wasn't enough to shoo away a predator, the vampire squid discharges a luminescent cloud of mucus instead of ink. The congealed swirl and curlicue of light temporarily baffles the predator, who ends up not knowing where or what to chomp, while the vampire squid simply whooshes away. It's as if you were chasing someone and they stopped, turned, and tossed a bucket full of large gooey sequins at your face. I wished I was a vampire squid the most when I was the new girl in high school. And I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. That, that snippet, I feel like, reverses course. We have research and then a little bit of heartbreak. Um, wonderful. So World of Wonders and all of our panelists' books you can find in the Festival Bookstore. We'll remind you later, but be sure to check it out. Our last reader before we start our conversation is Rebecca Morgan Frank, who is the author of, get ready for this book title, Oh, You Robot Saints, which is forthcoming in February, as well as three previous collections of poetry. Her collaborations with composers have been performed and exhibited all across the United States. And she is the co-founder and editor of the online magazine, Memorius. She is joining us, I believe, from Chicago, Illinois. Welcome to Morgan. Thanks so much, Stacy, and um, to all the other readers. I just wanted you all to keep reading, and um, I love that book so much, Amy. Uh, my new book, OU Robot Saints, is a lot of the research is automatons and robots, and I'm almost wishing that I'd read you my Octobot poem or my lionfish robot poem after Amy. Um, but this is a different kind of research where you Google your exes or people you used to know. Um, this is an excerpt from a long poem. Uh, it's called The Girlfriend Elegies. I did not find the body. It was wintertime where I was, women gathered in bars, their bodies like bare trees, naked arms giving fruit to hands and gestures. Ice was everywhere. I could still feel the command of your hands around a woman's waist when two-stepping. It was the only time you wore joy, your anger muscular in your small, tired body that always hurt. I had seen your childhood once. There was a hole in the wall of the living room. It led somewhere. Outside, the land was dry, grassless. We had come to rescue the dog whom we found wrestling her chain in the dirt. There was a lake somewhere nearby, but no sign of it except boats behind cars. Later, I learned your father was a sculptor, your mother what we now call a hoarder. The road home, was long, more dryness. Even the dog was wrapped in silence. We slept in the back of the truck, our heads at the opening watching stars fall. The future then a mirage, a place I'd save you. I bought you things on my credit card. We drank in the bars where everyone knew you and the Southwest summer burned through. And then there were months in which I tried to escape your drowning like a clasped 
around my throat. I fled in the night, years past. In the dry climates, there's less of an odor. There was no sign of the dog when they found you dead in your chair. It had been days. I thought of the woman in Croatia dead for decades in her apartment, no one to find her, find you. There was a word for you back then, mischievous in that one picture when we went to the mountains, your body awakening from the mysterious illness, alert fawn, a boy body freed momentarily from a terrible girlhood, which is not to say you would have ever wanted to be a man, which is not to say I could have saved you. Thanks. Oh, that ending. I need to take a second. Thank you so much to Rebecca, Morgan, Frank, and all of our readers. Um, we are here in Heartbreak or Research, Poets on the Writing Process, and we each got to hear a snippet of each writer. And now I think we'll bring everyone on stage and talk a little bit about what we do as writers, what where is that line between heartbreak and research for each of us? And if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the comments and we hope to bring everybody into this conversation. Um, so I'll start with a little something for Sky and everybody. So the line that really made me want to put this panel together was from her poem and it goes, you call it heartbreak, I call it research. And it inspired me to think about research for poems on like a wider level, but I also love that idea of reframing experience, that this is something that was that you could look at and say, it's done to me and I just have to feel it. Or you can say, no, this is something that I can take in and use to create. Um, so is there a moment that you or anybody wants to speak to where you had that like, oh, what's happening is about to be a poem. <laughs> um, no, you know, when I was working on A Faster Grave, um, I actually, before that, I had stopped writing poetry for a really long time. Um, my older brother uh, died of suicide and I couldn't write, you know, I just couldn't write. And so it, I then, I moved to LA. I kind of like ran away, you know, from my life. And once I was there, I fell in love with someone and I started writing again. Like I started being able to feel, to feel again, you know? And so it was kind of like those poems became um, an, uh, like an experiment with my feelings, like kind of stretching my, my little poetry legs to see what could happen, you know? And so once I started embarking on this new relationship, it kind of felt like both poetic research and life research. And so I just kind of was combining or conflating those two things to, you know, to come up with those poems. And I just think it's so interesting because we all kind of gather from our experiences and on some level, you know, to create, you know, something that means something to us. So that was really kind of where I, be I begun to kind of like dip into the well from. Yeah, thank you. Um, anybody else want to share on that level? Yeah, go ahead. And oh. Yeah, I I find that um, this idea of heartbreak, I, I had it all figured out in my head and now I'm getting a little tongue tied. Um, that the the, 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 the emotion and sort of life happening becomes a poem and then the research follows there's life and emotion um time as sky said you know setting aside like forgetting about the but then there's also um poems that are, come out of this idea of communal heartbreak like with the with the kids in the cages you know i have a few poems that i've written that I just um, had to write in the moment, and I there there wasn't time to 
it sort of had that luxury of space of, of um, emotional distance. Um, and I, I did uh, do a little research. Where are they keeping these kids? Where are they going? And where, you know, where, where are they? Um, so um, I, I hope that was a little coherent. <laughs> So I can jump in um, because uh, the work of Mr. Chance also touches on this um, communal the, um, heartbreak, um, but was also very much motivated by, by personal heartbreak. Um, one of the poems that I read has one, one part of the origin story of this strange, strange text um, in, in the Merchant of Venice reading party that was accidentally scheduled for Yom Kippur. Um, that led me to um, that experiencing my own rage in that moment taught me that I had some questions about that text and and led me into the erasure aspect. Um, but that work um, happened actually years before this manuscript took form and found its subject actually. Um, and that happened really unexpectedly um, while I was volunteering as an English teacher in a, in a refugee camp outside of Thessaloniki. And, um, and I, so I can point to, to the origin of tying together these threads, which, and, and what I remember is more the surprise. Um, like, I, I really love this question and, and the framing for this, this panel. And there are so many examples <laughs> that I could talk about um, that would be uh, more personal, but um, this was, um, I can point directly to the conceptual spark um, for bringing together these different threads for, for Mr. Chance. And, and one of them, and this is, so I'm gonna read this tiny scrap um, that is one of them. Um, it's one of the protection training poems, which are basically word for word what the camp psychologist said, training volunteers. Let's not even talk about the war or whatever you're running from. Let's say you have enough money to run. Let's say you cross the Turkish border without being arrested, without being tortured, without being raped. Let's say you get yourself a job on the black market. Let's say they pay you sometimes and eventually it's enough. Let's say they don't force your children to work or let's say they do, but you have enough to buy their freedom. Let's say it's enough to go to Izmir to walk three or four days in the forest. Let's say it's warm enough. Let's say you aren't kidnapped. Let's say you don't go missing. Let's say no one finds your body missing all major organs. Let's say you make it to the boats. So oh, that last, um, that last image about the organ trafficking was the, dark origin story for really this whole work because it made me think back to the Merchant of Venice and the Pound of Flesh. Um, and, and that was really the beginning of um, these questions about migration and identity um, moving through different historical periods um, and like in, and facing my own Jewish identity in Thessaloniki, um, which has a really unique and totally erased Jewish history. Um, uh, that's where it started to build gravity and bec become an idea. Yeah, I, I would say building from that, the way that um, researching and history can give us opportunities to access things that feel more personal or, or even global in new ways. Um, so writing a book where I was researching medieval automaton <laughs> and um you know finding this medieval monk who that becomes a symbol for looking at what does it mean if we don't have a human body who is blessing people or teaching people what does that mean for all the things that we've happened say in the catholic church or what does it mean for questions of sexual abuse of labor um what does it mean you know hearing a story of descartes making an automaton version of his daughter um trying to kind of think about the long history of people trying to make humans immortal, right? And so for me, I thought I was writing about medieval automata and I was writing about the loss of my mother who, who died during writing the book. And I don't know if I'd gone 
face first into writing about grief, they would have been terrible poems only accessible by me, but somehow having um, a medium that connects me, um, whether it's metaphorical language or the long history of human suffering or long history of human grappling with certain things um, is why I think external research is really helpful to me, whether it's literary or historical or object-based. I love what you said there, Rebecca, and I'll, I'll just keep my um, my comments brief because I co-sign everything you say that just sometimes reading about something else entirely can unlock, in your case, grief. Um, and, um, and Elizabeth, I love one thing, my favorite things about panels is that I get to learn something new about everything. I didn't know that um, you've taught in Thessaloniki before. Um, I teach in um, Thassos every summer uh, poetry, but we fly into Thessaloniki. Um, so I know it um, very well. And I, I didn't this summer, of course, because of, I was here in Oxford. Um, but anyway, um, I just wanted to say in terms of, um, I, I think I was just gonna really kind of agree with you, Rebecca. And, and just to give an example, um, in my poetry is that I, you know, my, I don't know, I always feel so guilty saying this because I'm an English professor, but my happy reading, um, you know, uh, you know, books is, is not necessarily literature, it's, it's science books, you know? Um, so I feel, and I read a ton of literature, but I read double the science books that I, you know, for that. So my idea of a good Saturday night is after this is I'm gonna have a little dinner and then I'm gonna unwind with a book on the giant squid. <laughs> and uh, I know that sounds so ner nerdy and ridiculous and stuff, but that is me, you know, I'm, I'm still the, you know, that nerd. And I have a, a poem in, um, in my collection, Oceanic, um, that starts, I had every intention of starting about this um, phenomenon, this actually disaster off the coast of Washington state where um, scientists, um, uh, um, Scientists did not know what was going on, and it was for the, you know, and that's really scary when scientists don't know what's going on, and it's still going on actually right now. This was from maybe 2017, I guess, um, but it's been three years, and starfish, just so you know, um, are pulling their arms apart. They're ripping their arms off their body and killing themselves off the coast, and, and, um, all these echinoderm specialists don't know what's going on. They think it might have something to do with um, the nuclear reactor in Japan, but they don't know. And so I had every intention to start with that kind of image because, you know, uh, imagining starfish pulling their arms off. Um, and then, oh, an ex-boyfriend from grad school popped into my poem. And then the poem and it turned a, turned a different way. But I would never have been able to unlock that poem that I think needed to come out in some way had I not started with that image of <laughs> ripping arms off. And so anyway, I just wanted to, to give that as an example of how reading outside your kind of, um, reading outside your genre um, uh, can just help unlock things as well. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm thinking um, back to the first piece Elizabeth read, um, those lines, myself as witness, myself as teacher, myself as erasure. Um, we all have, like, there's just such multitude there. And I think that sort of research Amy's talking about is one way to kind of like bring all those different selves all together. Um, it seems like ex-boyfriends are coming up a lot on this panel. <laughs> uh, and one of the questions I had for y'all is, when you're in the midst of that heartbreak, um, whether it's communal or more personal or something that you've stumbled upon reading, what what soothes that? Who do you, or what do you turn to when you have the blues? Is it art, music, science, something else? Melinda seems very... Yeah, well, I could definitely um, give you a hint of what <laughs> deep in the heartbreak. Um, and I also music um, and I also I don't know how I'm going to be able to unhear this business of the starfish ripping off their arms I mean I, gosh I absolutely love starfish and I'm so oh. that's, I'm heartbroken breaking right now it's uh, wow 
Um, but yeah, music, I think sometimes uh, uh, I, I kind of tend to go into this thing where I, I'm, I get stuck on one song that I want to either listen to or play over and over and over again. And uh, it's something that I I think I'm a teenager when you would be at the radio and you're like listening and you're waiting for that song yeah. or, or, or you have a recording over and over again. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, the um, uh, bird forgiveness, uh, um, the, mm -hmm. the last poem was written when um, after I, I took care of my grandmother uh, and she died uh, and um, I knew it was the end of life and that was that was the hardest thing for me to, to go through and and um, mm -hmm. and to, to write about that that was you know it was it was heartbreaking enough when my mother died at age 44 and mm -hmm. then fast forward you know 20 years late 20 some years later and then my grandmother and and i, I it's not because my grandmother survived my mother i just thought well she's you know she's always going to be around i kind of took it for granted that that she was that she was somehow just you know immortal but but then you know life <laughs> yeah heartbreak music so I can go next. Um, I think that um, something that helps me deal with my grief or to understand my grief is poetry, you know? And so if I feel, you know, really sad or heartbroken about something, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes you don't know that grief is what you're experiencing because it comes out as anger or frustration or anxiety, you know? and the moment you put yourself in front of the blank page and just say, okay, I'm just gonna see, you know, what happens, what develops here, you know, I think is, you know, one of the ways that I now cope with my own grief and heartbreak in a way that I wasn't able to do before. Um, also music, I'm the type of person, kind of like you said, Melinda, like to listen to the same song over and over and over again, if I get in a certain mood, you know, and so like, that's always something that's exciting uh, or just kind of like taking long drives and just, you know, being in the natural world, I think is something that during the pandemic, I feel like I've taken for granted, you know, like before, you know, just being able to get out of the house is something that I find really inspiring in a way that I didn't necessarily before. I was reading recently um, something that came up and it said, no one tells you how much grief is in growth. And that really resonated with me because it's true. You're putting something away. It's ending, it's over. And to grow, you end up going through a lot of grief. Um, there's a question from Megan here that maybe we can throw Morgan's way. Morgan, you talked a lot about how the death of your mother informed this most recent book. Can you tell us about how researching your grandfather informed your first book? Thanks so much, um, Megan, for that question. And uh, actually, that that research about my grandfather is a is a manuscript that I haven't published yet. Um, it's uh, called "We'll Never Get Back to Zamboanga," and it's um, I'm actually working on a libretto on it now and adapting that. Um, and so that was a sort of more personal family research story. And the short version is um, my grandfather, who's Filipino and was in um, a civilian internment camp in the Philippines through the duration of World War II and sort of delving into that history. And uh, it's been really interesting going back to those poems now. You know, I haven't quite decided what's going to happen with that book, but um, especially as we collective conversation about camps, <laughs> right? And internment is a very different kind of one. Um, also thinking about um, confinement and how 
people adapt to the situations they're in when, um, um, you know, what is it like to be a child, right? Adapting into those. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, delving, I don't know if anyone else has delved into family history in more specific ways. Um, it sounds like um, maybe so. And I'd love to hear about that because that's sort of this link between the personal and the external when you're going to the library to learn about something that's part of your personal history. Oh, I love that idea. I've always wished I could do that. I was adopted. So um, my research for my family poems is a little different. <laughs> um, I don't really have that lineage to turn back to. So personally, I've researched fairy tales and folk tales instead and kind of created my own mythology because I can. Um, I know you also are a composer and I hear tell Elizabeth is working on a on a um, opera, so maybe we can talk about composing. Would either of y'all like to uh, tell us more about those projects? Yeah, so I'm I'm working on a libretto um, in in uh, collaboration with a composer, Tucker Fuller, um, and the libretto um, involves both heartbreak and research. Um, uh, it's about the, it's a, its hero is an environmental activist, orca whale named J35, um, who made real whale, real hero, um, has been in the news, um, uh, particularly after the, the, the death of a calf, um, whose body she carried it on her nose for 17 days and more than a thousand miles. Um, in 2018. Um, more recently, she's uh, given birth to another calf who is thriving. Um, so update on J35 in case um, everyone else didn't just keep checking the Seattle Times at least weekly to check up on the whales like I did for the years um, since. But um, in terms of thinking about research for that um, project, a, a good part of the research that I'm doing is, is how to write a libretto and um, and looking at text um, that is sing trying to make sure that um, the language that I use is is singable um, and and kind of bending. It turns out that my my style, um, although um, I'm the only non musician in my family, I feel like my work is very very influenced by music. Um, I'm not super singable usually, um, so it's a real stretch for me. Um, and I'm just in the very beginning stages. I'm mostly still researching. I've, I've written just a tiny bit um, of actual libretto text at, the, at this moment. Um, but that's, um, yes, I would love to talk more about librettos. Well, in, in terms of composing, um, I, wrote my very first song after finishing um, Bird Forgiveness. And I, I never thought I would write any songs at all, but, um, but uh, my husband, Steve, he said, well, you're a poet, you should, you should write, you should write songs. It should be, and I, and I thought, oh, well, that's not, that just doesn't, you know, one doesn't follow the other, that's crazy. But, one one day I, I was at a coffee shop and I heard the melody. I heard the melody of uh, of the song, which I'm calling the Bird Forgiveness theme song. <laughs> and it's and and then I just was thinking about um, my the experience with my grandmother and that last poem in the book and. I wrote I wrote the song based on the poem, um, and then uh, it, last year I just started writing songs that were born songs that weren't based on a, a, a poetry. So, um, but they have a lot in common: um, composing songs and poems. It says. Uh, as you would know by our poet lore, uh, our, uh, um, yeah, 
the connection between poets and, and musicians and, and composers and singer-songwriters. Yeah, I would just say briefly, I'm not a composer. And if you had eavesdropped on the remedial Zoom mandolin class I was in on Wednesday night, um, you would know there's not a musical mode, bone in my body. Um, but I, I just want to pipe in and say, you know, where do we find comfort? For me, it's in community and collaboration. And, you know, like Elizabeth, having access to music through composers. And that's been some of the great collaborations during the pandemic when I felt stuck um, doing some work with composers that I work with, or even a friend, there's a day where you're struggling and someone sends you a poem and says, hey, can I have your comments? And, um, and that kind of lifts you up. Just the other idea that other people can keep making even in hard times is I find uh, keeps me going. That brings up a really good point. Like, have y'all been able to make in hard times? I know Melinda wrote a, read a recent poem that was written. Um, for me, it's been slow and it's been a struggle. Maybe we can just kind of go across and talk about about that. What what is it like creating something now and um, what is inspiring whatever it is that you are creating? I talk a lot about um, this with my students and uh, it is, I mean, we are in a global pandemic among other dramas and traumas um, to say nothing of the heartbreak that went through our country in particular this past summer um, on a political level and the protests that were going on there. So I have just been so fractured. And I think it's important, I try to say some version of that every time I do a reading to let people know that it's not, you know, um, no matter how many books or whatever you have, uh, I'm human too, you know, and it, it has been very, very hard for me to write. But what I have found that helps is, um, going back with what Sky said, is being outside. Um, forest bathing when I can, you know, when it's safe and um, the trails here in Mississippi aren't crowded with people. And But I also practice what I call small stakes writing, meaning my bar has uh, lowered so much. And I, that's hard for me as a Capricorn to say, <laughs> because I love to just achieve, achieve, achieve. But um, so um, I, I want all the applause because that is hard for me to say that my that I have willingly lowered my bar. But you know what? I'm so much happier, and I don't have that anxiety that I just have been riddled with all of 2020, basically, I, really since 2016. Um, and what I mean by small stakes writing is this: I simply call. Um, so this is something that people listening in, you all can can borrow this idea. I keep what's called the Sky Journal. It's just it's um. It's just whatever like notebook you have. You know, we're all writers and we all have probably blank notebooks up the wazoo. So just take one of your blank notebooks. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just write in big letters, sky journal, and just make observations about what you see. And you know, some of you I know might be stuck inside, but all you need is a window. So I'm not even saying that you need to become the row or anything like that, but just see if you could teach yourself um, maybe the names of four clouds. Um, and that's something that you could teach yourself, especially those who are, again, home um, and just feeling like they're not doing anything creatively. That's something super creative. And also that is something human to want to do is to wonder and just be curious about the planet. You could just simply make an observation of what do you smell at sunset? What do you see at sunset? What do you, if you're a morning person, what do you smell or see or hear at sunrise? You know. These do not have to be poems, but they are just ways, they're like practice for the Olympics later, you know, later. Um, maybe your later is next week. Maybe you'll be able to draft a poem next week. Maybe you won't draft a poem until 2022, but you know what, that's okay also. That's also okay. And I think more of us need to be saying that as well. And you know, when I was in grad school, I had so many people like, you need to write every day and it needs to be a job and it needs to, you know, you need to spend three hours on it. I couldn't do that when I was when I was single and and happy. And, you know, um, 
So why could I, why should I hold myself to that standard um, when I have kids and I am struggling, you know, um, uh, you know, it just struggling with what's going on, on on this planet, struggling what's going on with our government, stuff like that too. So I, but I would never say that I'm not writing. I would never say I'm not writing. Um, I'm just not forming full poems, but that is also okay. That is also okay. Because they'll come, they'll come, the poems will come. Yeah, I like to say that not writing is writing too. Um, I would also never say that I'm not writing. Um, although, in fact, during this pandemic, I have produced two new poems and one revision. Full story of production during this time. And yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm really proud That's of that. Huge. I am. Because actually, it's not just two, it's two. Yeah, but um, I, I, th I think like what, like what Amy brought up about the kind of grad school mentality and the the way that discipline is often described and um, or demanded of of younger writers um, doesn't leave much room for this. I think something that's um, really helped me during this particular set of crises um, is that. Um, my previous experience going through um, the Hurricane Katrina in the aftermath, I lost the ability to write completely for a time. And, and I started making visual art. Um, uh, and then by the time I had like a body of visual art, then I had a chapbook of poems to, to go with it. So like I, having had that, con that experience as a younger poet, um, I have a lot of faith that like that that's kind of where that faith comes from is like yeah i'm not always i'm not always writing but i am always writing um and also um also thanks brad and also um back to a question that stacy asked earlier about comfort um it's not like in terms of what i turn to absolutely music as many other uh, <laughs> uh panelists said um, in the moment music, but in terms of um, like what's comforting in the writing process, I think it, it, it is, is that even in the moment of, of heartbreak, um, I, have, I have a sense that um, although I'm not gonna rush it, eventually I will probably write about it. And um, it does change even in the moment of that terrible experience. I, I'm going through this, um, this in the, I, I unexpectedly uh, saw my rapist on TV last week. <laughs> and I've been moving through that and like, I'm not gonna write about that anytime soon, but um, what what a wild circumstance um, to bring up uh, ancient painful history um, in this moment that I was totally unprepared for it. And there is, there is a part of me that's already working through the poem that that will be, although it's well under the surface right now. And yeah. I think something that's kind of bringing me comfort um, right now is trying to figure out different ways to inspire myself, you know? So I started, trying to take swimming lessons, you know, I was like, what can I do that's socially distant that like is something I've really never done before that might activate something, you know? And so I started doing swimming lessons and I swear, I mean, I'm in Vermont. So it's like, I'm like the only black person that I ever see, you know, but I remember the first time I went to take my swim lesson, I walked into the pool and it was just like all of these white people in the pool and it was just me, you know? And I started thinking about, you know, like the history of racism in our country and how 80, 60 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to do that, you know? And so it, it's kind of working in a sense that like, I think if you can figure out some different, just putting yourself in some sort of unique situation, cause we're all like stuck at home, you know? Like I, I just went and picked up some paint today. I was like, I'm gonna like try to paint. I'm gonna try to draw. I'm gonna try to do something new, you know? Just to 
keep it keep it going but but yeah that's you know what's been bringing me comfort like experimenting with ways to expand art in my life i guess well thank you all um this was such a rich and inspiring we worked through a lot in this discussion we are just about out of time being that this is words and music and how much music came up in our conversation um if melinda's still willing to play us out with her song i figured we can part ways hear her song and then our panel will be complete um, thank you all, everyone, for tuning in. Don't forget to check out the festival bookstore. Tell your friends how much fun you had at Words and Music. And um, let us know what you're thinking in the chat. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And uh, that poem is going to be amazing, Elizabeth. Kids live in a crooked cage. Thank you guys so much. I feel so inspired by thinking about the way that sort of y'all's personal experiences inform your craft, which I think in a really interesting way leads us into the next session, which is African-American spirituality in Mardi Gras, and really thinking about how the act of masking can be a spiritual thing. So I'm really excited for that. It starts at 5.15, so in about 12 minutes, don't forget, 
that this festival is accessible to the public for free on a donation basis. So if you like what you saw, if you are looking forward to what you're about to see, if you're looking forward to our Tom Drent Day tomorrow, go ahead and support us. You can do that by clicking on those links in the comments section. You can also go to your PayPal and hit wordsandmusic at gmail.com. Type that in, make your donation there, or you can go to your phone and you can text WAM20, WAM20 to 44321. Suggested donation is 10 bucks. We'll take one or 1,000. I really appreciate all you guys being here and especially for all the comments that kept coming and really showing love to the panelists here today because that really is what we want, right? We want that live interaction, even in a virtual festival. Speaking of things you can do to interact with us, do not forget to go shop at Tubby and Coos in our virtual bookstore. You can do that with a link in the comments section or through the festival website, Words and Music, no, Words and Music, I'm sorry, wordsandmusic.org. It's the link on the homepage. We will see you now in 11 minutes for Mystery in Motion, African-American Spirituality in Mardi Gras, curated by Kim Vaz-Deville. Thank you.